Hey everyone, I'm back today with a video on The Haunting of Hill House. I'm considerably late since its appearance on Netflix, but with the arrival of The Haunting of Bly Manor, I wanted to revisit this adaptation of Shirley Jackson's novel. I'd like to address the three things the show did right, and we'll be starting right now. Obviously, spoiler warnings if you haven't seen the show yet, and trigger warning as this review will include references to suicide, depression, and all-around psychotic degradation. On to the video. First, let's address Nellie's character. If you haven't read the novel, Eleanor slash Nellie is the main character and the narrative is focused on her and her fragile emotional well-being. I want to applaud episode 5 for managing the consequences of her unresolved grief for the loss of her mother, the trauma of her childhood, and the literal demonstration of a self-haunting. Jackson's stories tend to involve a recurring theme with her traumatized or mentally unstable characters. Their state of mind drives them into these supernormal experiences which is blatantly extended in the show. This you will notice in many occurrences, take episode 6 for example. There are seamless shifts of reality between the Harris Funeral Home and Hill House, demonstrating some paranormal or external force arising from the character stress. In the novel, Nellie's issues first appear from her elevated perception of others and her unwillingness to address herself honestly. She frequently lies about her age and aspects of her life to the other characters and is in constant consideration of the opinions others hold of her. Nellie's struggle with reality and her inability to cope with grief of losing her mother prior to the story leads to her suicide. In both the novel and the show, in a moment too late does she hesitate. In Jackson's version, Nellie drives away from Hill House and suddenly, in a moment of quick cleverness, accelerates into a tree. Nellie's last words were not only laden with hesitation but also a hopeless realization. She says, why am I doing this? Why don't they stop me? The Netflix adaptation showed this version of Nellie very well, as she's still somewhat childlike and dependent on her lost mother, rendering her death to be emotionally painful for the reader or viewer. Her grief makes such an impression in the novel that in the adaptation, each crane child, including Nellie, represents a stage of grief. Stephen as denial, Shirley, anger, Theo, bargaining, Luke, depression, and Nell, acceptance. The last point I did not discover on my own, there are several resources that verify this, and I will add some links to the description. The next thing Hill House did right was the confrontation of the paranormal. What is a ghost to a person? Or how writer Zoe Heller puts it in The Haunted Mind of Shirley Jackson is the demon of the mind. As said by Stephen Crane in the first episode, a ghost can be a lot of things. A memory, a daydream, a secret, grief, anger, guilt. But in my experience, most times they're just what we want to see. Most times a ghost is a wish. In Heller's interpretation of Shirley Jackson's writing, she clarifies that the evils of the supernatural are only Jackson's way of expressing her own anxieties and fears. About a year ago, I had written an extensive essay dissecting the paranormal occurrences in Jackson's stories. In it, I approached the scene where Nellie is accused of writing, help Eleanor come home. This phrase is slightly reworded in the adaptation. Using textual evidence from the novel and identifying the narrative as unreliable allowed me to prove that Nellie was in fact the person who wrote on the wall. And just as similarly in the show, it is revealed that Nellie's mother was the one who had written it. In both instances, the person guilty of these haunts are self-inflicted. The third topic mostly extends from the previous analysis of ghosts to themes of fear and guilt. Jackson's version of Theodora often says fear and guilt are sisters, and coincidentally on the show, Theo is expressively fearful of her sensitive ability to see into others, and her sister, Shirley, embodies shame and guilt over her affair. This fear and guilt is most experienced by Nellie in Jackson's Haunting of Hill House. It is this fear and guilt that intensify her experiences, making the ghost in the narrative questionable. Jackson once said, One cannot fear something that doesn't exist. If Jackson's philosophy holds true in the lens of Hill House, then the paranormal is not of any significance. In the novel, Luke attests to Jackson's philosophy and extends it by saying, we fear seeing ourselves clearly and without disguise. The reason this becomes so relevant in the show is how distracted Nellie had to be to cope with her life. Her marriage to Arthur was only a temporary aid. In the first episode, the viewers gather an unhealthy perception Nellie's siblings have of her. And though Stephen is meant to represent denial most of all in Hill House, it is evident all the Crane children are subjected to confronting a part of themselves that they are battling with. Another topic that I think is worthy mentioning, kind of like an honorable mention, I guess, is the maternal significance of Hill House. Though it is not as perceivable in the show, a reader of Shirley Jackson would notice the red flags in the conversation between Olivia and her twin children, Luke and Nellie. This chilling exchange resonates a mother's desire to protect her children, which consequently conjures her awareness of the dangers that lurk in the outside world. Hill House's predatory hold on Olivia reflects Nellie's dependence on Hill House in the novel. She is so consumed by it that she begins to feel that she is disappearing inch by inch into the house. If you have not read The Haunting of Hill House and you're looking for something eerie and not so glass shatteringly horrifying, I do recommend this for spooky season or for any season really. Thank you all for watching and for all the writers out there, 
happy writing.